Greetings, Commanders. I am Commander Toyonanos, and welcome to AX Academy. In this introductory course, we're going to introduce you to the basics of anti-xeno combat in Elite Dangerous. We'll show you the most common ship we recommend, how to build it, and the engineers you'll want to have access to. We'll also show you where to find specific Thargoid Interceptor variants, how to fight them, and some common mistakes new pilots make. But first, let's start by meeting the enemy, the Thargoids. Greetings, Commanders. Let's discuss the endgame bosses of Elite Dangerous, the Thargoids. You will soon meet them in combat and knowing your enemy is out of the battle. There are two categories of Thargoids, Scouts and Interceptors. Scouts are nuisance at most. They are easy to deal with, so we won't be talking about them in this video. Rather, we will discuss their much larger relatives, Interceptors. There are five Interceptors variants four of which are combat-focused, and the fifth one is a bit special, as it will run away when confronted. Among combat-focused interceptors, the Cyclops is the first one you're likely to face. While it is the weakest, it's still a powerful foe, much stronger than any NPC which you may have faced to date. The Basilisk is the fastest interceptor. It represents a significant step up in difficulty over the Cyclops. The Medusa eats like a truck and it's a bullet sponge, in addition, its swarm is much stronger. The Hydra is the ultimate challenge. It takes everything the Medusa is to the next level. Very few commanders have faced an Hydra one-on-one -on -one and lived to tell the tale. In most of Elite Dangerous, should it and Elite dies is a viable strategy. Not so with the Thargoids Interceptors. Interceptors have a special module called Hearts, which constantly regenerate damage with their hull. To defeat an Interceptor, you will need to sequentially exert and destroy all of its hearts, which are not exerted at the beginning of the fight. You will need to force them to exert by dealing sufficient damage. Note that Thargoids are immune to pretty much all kinds of weapons except for the specialized anti xeno weapons. Once you hit an Interceptor hard enough, one of the hearts will start glowing orange. That indicates that the heart is now exerted and vulnerable. Shoot it. Then rinse and repeat. Every Interceptor will deploy a companion entity known as a Swarm. The Swarm is composed of many individual drones, called Thargons. The Swarm is among the most dangerous elements of fighting an Interceptor. Let's look at how they work. Swarms are released once the Thargoid perceives you as a threat, and will attack in tandem with the Interceptor once it has become hostile. The size of the Swarm encountered depends on the variant of Interceptor you're facing. The harder the variant, the more Thargons in its Swarm. The Hydra Swarm has four times as many drones as the Cyclopses. The Swarm will attack your ship independent of the Interceptor, flying in various patterns according to one of its two states. The first state is Standard State. In Standard State, the Swarm group together in a ball, ring, or cone shape. Here it will fire low accuracy projectile attacks dealing phasing damage, which will partially pierce shields. Shields can be detrimental here as they will increase the size of your hitbox and make you take a lot more hits. The second state is what the community is called agitated. An agitated state is triggered when a ship passes through a swarm in standard state. It can be recognized by its shape, either death wall, death spiral, or the ring of death formation. In this state, the swarm can not only hit you with projectile attacks, but it can also launch groups of Thargon missiles at your ship when within 3 kilometers, dealing massive damage. If you agitate a swarm, remember that passing back through it will quickly reset it back to the standard state. In addition to its states, the swarm is sensitive to each Thargoid's enrage timer. An interceptor becomes enraged after a set period of time has passed without any of its hearts having been destroyed. An enraged interceptor will keep replenishing its swarms, with no upper limit as to how many times it will deploy. When enraged, it's important to pay close attention to the swarm state, as an agitated swarm will no longer fire groups of Thargons, but will instead fire a full kamikaze strike, quickly ending the fight, and not in your favor. In addition to their main cannon and the companion swarm, interceptors have three kinds of special attacks. The first such special attack is lightning. Lightning activates after the first heart is destroyed, and it will remain active for the rest of the fight. Its trigger point is a distance of 700 meters, and it will remain locked onto you up to 800 meters. 
Should you get caught by lightning, your ship will effectively be immobilized. One of your modules will randomly reboot, hopefully not your thrusters, and you'll take quite a bit of both hull and module damage. Shielded ships are especially vulnerable to lightning, as lightning is extremely effective at draining shields. If you do get caught, there's little point trying to get away, as you won't be able to. The best thing to do is turn towards the Thargoid and keep firing. It's precious DPS and a point-blank rage, it's hard to miss. The second special attack is Caustic Missiles. Caustic Missiles are fired from the second heart destroyed onwards. Upon getting hit by a Caustic Missile, your hull indicator will turn green and you will constantly be taking hull damage. This lasts until you get rid of the Caustic, so it's generally pretty important to get rid of Caustic as quickly as possible. To remove Caustic from your ship, you could use decontamination limpets, but those are very slow and generally not recommended. The much faster method is to instead overheat your ship, typically by turning on silent running and then firing off a few rounds of Goss. In this example, heat quickly gets to 300%, which instantly burns Caustic off. A double tap of heat sinks returns the heat back to a normal range very quickly. Waiting a few seconds before overheating allows you to burn the caustic off at a slightly lower heat level, so it's not essential to bring your heat up immediately. Caustic missiles can be avoided, or if you have really good aim, can even be shot down. It's generally better just to dodge them, however. Shooting them down is very hard. The final special attack is the shutdown field. A shutdown field triggers when only one heart remains. Shutdown fields are also triggered in combat zones and some other specific situations like hyperdictions. Shutdown fields are dangerous. They turn your ship off entirely. You'll be a sitting duck with no ability to turn, move, or do anything for an extended period of time. All the while, the swarm and the interceptor will be happily shooting at you. It's not a good situation to find yourself in. Shutdown fields can be hard countered with a shutdown field neutralizer. A shutdown field neutralizer drains your system capacitor very quickly. If you choose to equip one, know that the timing of when you fire is very important. The module will stop protecting you once the capacitor is empty. On the plus side, shutdown field neutralizers protect not just you, but others around you as well. At full charge, they will protect anyone within a 3 km radius of you. Still, considering shutdown fields are quite quick, this benefit is of little practical use as you rarely have time to actively seek such shelter in the thick of a fight. If you don't have a shutdown field neutralizer and you trigger a shutdown field, the best course of action is to engage flight assist off and boost away. Unlike normal flight which brings you to a dead stop when shut down, in flight assist off you keep drifting after you're hit. You'll still be shut down, but you'll be moving away and in this case, floating away is a much better alternative to standing still and getting shot at. An additional item worth mentioning as we discuss Thargoids is the Xeno Scanner. The scanner is not essential to the fight, but can occasionally come in quite handy. Just by having a scanner installed on your ship, you'll be able to see detailed information about the hull and the shields of the Thargoid Interceptor, as well as the number of Thargons left in the swarm. Without a scanner, you'll be left guessing or relying on other methods to access the same information. Additionally, you're able to actively use the scanner to acquire a so-called detailed scan. You can typically get that before starting a fight, as it takes a while and it's limited to a range of 500 meters. That detailed scan provides module information, in this case heart information for the interceptor, and allows you to sub-target the hearts. That's particularly useful in identifying the specific spot you need to hit when you're sniping the hearts. AX Combat is the endgame content of Elite Dangerous. As such, diving in unprepared will most likely result in frustration and rebuys. Thargoid vessels are highly specialized and extremely dangerous. Our ships must be purposefully designed to counter them. Since Thargoid interceptors are immune to regular weapons, our loadout is limited to a set of four experimental anti-Xeno or Guardian weapons. Guardian weapons massively outperform the AX ones. The Guardian Gauss Cannon stands out as the best all-around anti-Thargoid weapon. In order to properly fight the Thargoids, we must make the long trip to the Guardian Ruins to unlock it. Available in medium and small sizes, Gauss functions similarly to a railgun. It is a hit-scan type of weapon, which makes it perfect for making the precision shots required to destroy the hearts of the Thargoid Interceptor. 
While you're at the Guardian sites, you may want to pick up blueprints and materials for three other modules, which, while optional, can come in handy. The Guardian FSD booster, Guardian hull reinforcement packages and Guardian module reinforcement packages. Most Thargoid weaponry uses heat-based targeting. It is incapable of locking on to a low temperature target. Consequently, if we are to survive, we need a way to deal with the high heat generation of Gauss cannons. Heat sink launchers are the solution to that problem and a core element of the AX meta. Using heat sinks correctly allows us to avoid incoming damage. They are our lifeline and the more of them we can bring, the better our chances. Thargoid vessels are surprisingly fast and agile, and are able to completely mobilize vessels they manage to catch up to, exposing them to devastating weapons fire. That makes the third and final component of the AX meta a ship that can mount and power four Guardian Gauss cannons, bring plenty of heat sinks, outmaneuver the Thargoids, and withstand their attacks should you fail to avoid them. Fully engineering your ship is strongly recommended, and while it is possible to engage in AX combat with a partially engineered vessel, be prepared to face a much more significant challenge. We will dive deeper into ship build theory later on in this guide, but overall here's what you'll need before you can get started. The aforementioned Guardian technology unlocked, at least 100 million credits for outfitting a ship and covering several rebuys and either purchasing a set of four serious heatsinks at special megaships or access to the engineer Ram Ta for engineered ones. You'll also want access to the engineers Professor Palin, The Dweller, Felicity Farseer and Celine Jean. You'll also want to set up your ship controls properly and gain at least a basic level of familiarity with flight assist off. Professor Palin provides thruster engineering, and you can get easy access to him if you don't have it already using the unclassified relic method that also works for Ram Ta and for which there is a short guide in the video description. An easier alternative to unlocking Palin is simply upgrading your drives to just G3 via Felicity Farseer, but keep in mind that speed is a crucial factor in AX combat and this will make fighting the Thargoids significantly more challenging. The Dweller does distributor engineering, which will greatly improve both our offensive and evasive capabilities, and beam laser engineering, which allows us to make a very useful utility weapon, a long-range thermal vent beam laser. Celine Jean provides armor engineering, and since AX builds typically forgo having a shield generator, your armor is the only buffer for mistakes you have. An alternative to Selene Jean are Guardian hull reinforcements, which provide less protection overall and have a power draw, but do not need to be individually engineered. Lastly, the engineer Liz Ryder can offer a small but not insignificant armor upgrade via cheap G1 engineering. Engineering the rest of the ship's modules provides marginal or quality of life benefits and can be considered optional. While most, if not all, ships can be effective AX vessels in the right hands of an experienced commander, there is one that stands above the rest, excelling in every situation and having no glaring weaknesses, the Alliance Chieftain. The Meta Chieftain is a highly capable and versatile AX ship, suitable for beginners and veterans alike. It will allow you to take on just about anything, from a single Cyclops to multiple Hydras. Let's discuss how to build one, starting with hardpoints. You will want to equip two medium and two small Gauss cannons, as that's the optimal configuration given the Chief's power distributor. Place the medium ones in the Chief's large hardpoints and the small in the lateral small hardpoints, which are the two last small hardpoints in the outfitting screen. Pay particular attention to not placing Gauss in the bottom slot, as that would result in terrible convergence. In the remaining small hardpoint, place a long-range thermal vent beam laser. You may choose the fixed variant if you want a bit more DPS and a bit less cooling, or the gimbaled variant for the opposite effect and easier aim. A third is worse than both, so we don't recommend it. Finally, in the medium hardpoint, on the bottom of the ship, you should install a remote release flak launcher. Make sure it's the fixed version. Moving on to the core modules. Because the damage you will be facing in AX is caustic and absolute, the resistances offered by the different types of armor are irrelevant. Instead, we want to go for as many raw hull points as possible. Military grade composites with heavy duty engineering and the deep plating experimental effect offer the most, without the additional cost and rebuy expense of reactive or mirrored armor. A 6A power plant with armored engineering and thermal spread experimental offers the ideal mix of power and heat efficiency for this build. 
Thrusters are the most critical module for cold orbiting. You should use 6A thrusters, engineered with dirty drive engineering and the drag drive's experimental effect. After thrusters, the second most important module is the power distributor. As Gauss cannons are extremely energy hungry, your power distributor puts an upper limit on how much damage you can deal. With a weak distributor, your weapons will quickly run out of power and you will overheat. For the chief, the best distributor is a 6A power distributor with charged enhanced engineering and the super conduits experimental effect. For the sensors, you should choose to derate them in order to save a bit of weight and power. They should be engineered for long range to keep the interceptors on our scanner even at a distance. For life support, lighter is better, as you can always synthesize oxygen in an emergency. Derated with lightweight engineering is the way to go. For the frameshift drive, it's really down to personal preference. A 5A FSD is recommended, but not essential. Either the doubly pre-engineered 5A or a 5A with increased range and mass manager. The stock fuel tank works fine. Coming to the optional internals, they will be focused on protecting and repairing your hull and modules. By design, we will be foregoing a shield. Cold orbiting designs work best without one, as Stargoid weapons partially pierce shields. The only thing shields are good for is making you a bigger target. You should start off by protecting your modules. A larger 5D and two smaller 2D and 1D module reinforcement packs or MRPs is the way to go. The Guardian versions of the MRPs are a bit better than the normal ones, but the normal ones work just fine if you don't have the Guardian version. Having module protection in place, you should think about repairs. There are two things you will need to repair. Hull and modules. To repair modules, a 2A auto field maintenance unit is recommended. If your MRPs are properly set up, you will mainly be repairing those, but look out for other modules in bad shape as well. To repair the hull and instantly fix your canopy, equip a 5D repair limpet controller, noting the A-rated version repairs the same amount but weighs more and needs more power. In order to get any use out of the repair limpet controller, we need to carry limpets. To carry limpets, you need a cargo rack. A size 4 cargo rack is recommended, giving us the capacity to carry 16 limpets. The corrosion resistant version, if you have it, has the advantage of allowing you to carry the hearts of our fallen enemies without suffering corrosion damage to your modules, but it's not otherwise required. Finally, we need to fill the three military slots. Put three size 4 hull reinforcement packs in those. Engineer them with heavy duty and deep plating experimental. You will be thankful for the extra hull points they provide. What you will rely on to keep you cold during attack runs are heatsink launchers. Heatsinks are so important to this build that you should fill each and every utility slot available with them. The pre-engineered series heatsink launchers are the best if you have them. If you don't, regular ones engineered for ammo capacity work very well too. Alternatively, one of the heatsink launchers can be replaced by a different utility, such as a shutdown field neutralizer or a Xeno scanner depending on your intended combat environment and personal preference. This completes the meta chieftain build. As you may have noticed, it is heavily engineered and the engineering should generally be maxed out at grade 5. AX combat is unforgiving. You will need every bit of advantage you can muster to succeed. However, as we appreciate the grind involved to engineer a high-end ship can be off-putting, we have created a low engineering version of it which can be built with only a handful of entry-level engineers unlocked. Links to this build and to the low engineering version are provided in the video description section. So, now that you've built your ship, you're going to need a base of operations to work out of. Fortunately, we have Copernicus Observatory in the Astrobe system. It's the perfect station due to the target-rich environment, as well as the added benefit of there being no planetary gravity wells nearby. This makes for faster turnaround times when you need to repair your ship quickly or cash in those bonds. There are many places to find interceptors, but the most common way new pilots find them is by using the signal source system in the navigation menu. You can scan each unidentified signal source one by one, or you can reveal all of the signal sources in a system in one go. Just drop in on the nav beacon and complete a scan of it. After the scan is completed, jump back into SuperCruise and your navigation menu will now have every signal source logged and classified for you to review. What we're looking for is non-human signal sources, also known as NHSSs. 
you'll note there are multiple threat levels for NHSSs, and each has its own unique group of enemies. We're going to focus on the NHSS Threat Level 5, as they have the interceptor you're going to want to start out against, the Cyclops. When you find an NHSS, if it shows this salvage or canister icon, you can be assured it has an interceptor that corresponds with a threat level indicated. If you're in a system without a nav beacon, another way you can quickly find interceptors is by using the full spectrum scanner trick. By tuning precisely using this graphic, you can find NHSSs which have interceptors more rapidly than scanning each signal source one by one. There are other ways to find interceptors as well, including static distress calls, megaships, and AX conflict zones. More information can be found regarding each of these on the AXI website. Hi, I'm Schwinky, and I'll be discussing the basics of the cold orbiting technique. The goal of cold orbiting is to utilize the enhanced maneuverability granted by a flight assist off to allow you to safely avoid fire while on the interceptor's attack range while simultaneously returning fire. Mastery of this technique is essential to becoming a skilled AX pilot and working your way up the interceptor ladder. A quick disclaimer, cold orbiting is a very dense topic, and to truly grasp the concept, a much longer and more thorough video would be required along with plenty of practice. But that's not the goal of this section. This is only meant to serve as an introduction to the topic. If you want to dive into AX combat and get good at it, you'll eventually want to look at more in-depth guides, which fortunately we can offer. We'll have links in both the description and later on in this video. So, let's start with the name of the technique, cold orbiting. The name is self-descriptive, so let's break it down to its components. The cold in cold orbiting refers to how we keep ourselves cool to avoid accurate detection and aim from the interceptor. With temperatures below 20% and adequate speed, but we'll come back to that in a sec, the interceptor's aim will be thrown off as it cannot properly lead you and will constantly fire behind you. This is initiated via a long-range thermal vent beam to get ourselves down to 0% heat prior to entering the interceptor's 3km attack range. Once within range, we maintain this low heat throughout the attack run via a combination of heat sinks and stagger firing your Gauss. By keeping the heat sink active at all times, your heat will constantly be getting dumped, ideally keeping you in the 0 to 20% heat range. And by stagger firing your Gauss, a single volley is not going to cause you to momentarily spike over 20%, which will cause you to become vulnerable to the interceptor's cannon. Now let's talk about the orbiting part of cold orbiting. Orbiting refers to the maneuvering you do about the interceptor during an attack run. It's important to remember that the Thargoid is not a stationary object, but rather chasing you down at all times and in a somewhat erratic flight path. Your goal is to control your movement about the interceptor to establish a relative perpendicular vector to its direction of travel, while maintaining an optimal range of approximately 1.5 kilometers. So how do we accomplish this? By using downward thrust, we're able to establish a relative perpendicular vector to the interceptor, and then once we've got that, we're able to control our range by utilizing our forward and backward thrusters. Also, to adjust the interceptor's movements and maintain that perpendicular vector, we'll use our left and right thrusters, which are known as our lateral thrusters. These can also be used in conjunction with the forward and backward thrusters to aid in range control. The key here is less is more. If you're over controlling the ship, then you're gonna struggle with your aim. By minimizing your inputs, going slow, and staying calm, then you'll keep yourself under control and have a good orbit. Lastly, we need to talk about the blue zone. As you may be familiar with flight assist on, the blue zone is where your ship is the most maneuverable. The blue zone still applies even with flight assist off. In the Meta Chief build, the speed range for the blue zone is approximately 200 to 300 meters per second. And when your speed is in the blue zone, you're maximizing your maneuverability, which means that your thruster inputs are gonna be more responsive and therefore you're gonna have better control of your orbit. If you're outside of the blue zone, a couple of things could happen. If you're too slow, the interceptor can land its shots on you as you're not moving quickly enough to outrun its fire. And if you're too fast, then your orbit will decay and eventually lead to a stall, which means that the interceptor is able to catch up to and match your vector, which allows it to shoot you. In other words, that relative perpendicular motion that I mentioned from before is completely lost. Now, if you put all this together, what you end up with, ideally, is a constant relative perpendicular vector to the interceptor at approximately a 1.5 kilometer range, maintaining heat of 0 to 20%, and constantly applying damage while simultaneously avoiding damage. Very easy to say, but much harder to master in practice. But once you have mastered it, you, not the Thargoid, will be in full control of the fight. You've learned about Thargoids, you've built a ship, you've learned how to find them, now it's time to fight them. We'll demonstrate a fight against the Thargoid Cyclops, the first interceptor you're likely to face. 
Begin the fight by attacking the Goid with your Thermal Vent Beam Laser and then boosting away. After taking aggro, you want to get beyond 3km range as quickly as possible, as 3km is the range of an intercepted spin cannon. When you're beyond that distance and away from the swarm, you're in a safe position. After boosting away, turn Flight Assist off and spin around so that you're now moving backwards and away from the Interceptor. At this point, the Interceptor will have finished deploying the Swarm, which will be flying towards you. The goal of this phase of the fight is to destroy the Swarm. The Flak Launcher is very effective against the Swarm, so long as the aim and timing of shots is precise. You want to aim and fire just after the Swarm changes direction. Not before, not after. Having destroyed the Swarm, use a Thermal Vent Beam on the Interceptor to cool off and initiate an orbit. The beam allows you to do so without wasting precious heat sinks. Once you are in range, Gauss optimal range is 1.5 kilometers, deploy a heatsink and open fire with your Gauss cannons. Note, one of the hearts starts glowing after you've done sufficient damage. Shoot the exerted heart until it breaks off. If the Goy turns away from you, like it did in this case, you can still hit the heart from behind. After the first heart is destroyed, the interceptor will start going yellow. It has armed its lightning special attack and is actively chasing you, trying to get you 800 meters. There are two ways to deal with lightning at this stage. The easiest option is to boost away and keep your distance until the Goid gives up on the chase. It'll launch a second swarm upon giving up. A more risky option, demonstrated here but generally reserved for slower ships which cannot outrun the interceptor, is to lightning bait the attack. Let it get close to 1.2 kilometers, then boost straight at it. Dodge it at the last moment, then keep boosting straight away and past it. With some luck, the interceptor won't have enough time to fire its special attack, and you will be safe and far away. In between hearts, you'll be waiting for the Goid to deploy its next swarm while using your thermal van beam to stay cold and chip away at the shield. Unlike traditional NPCs, Hargoid interceptor shields have a natural decay. Even if you don't hit them at all, they will naturally drain over a set period of time. A thermal vent beam speeds up that process a little, but its main purpose remains to keep you cold. The time between hearts is also an ideal time to repair your ship using repair limpets and your AFMU, and synthesize ammo for your heat sinks, flak, and gauss as may be needed. Once a new swarm launches, it's really just rinse and repeat. You should always engage heat sinks before firing Gauss. This is critically important. Heat sinks are the most important asset you have in this fight. Without heat sinks, you die. It's that simple. If you watched the part of this video in which we talk about Thargoids, you will be aware of that after each heart is destroyed, the Goid will use its special attacks. After the first heart, you've seen the lightning chase. After the second heart, you'd normally see caustic missiles, and after this third heart, you'd normally see a shutdown field fire. However, as you may have noticed, neither of the latter two have triggered in this fight. We've been able to avoid triggering them by staying cold the whole time. A Goid cannot lock on you when you are cold. If a Goid cannot get a lock on you, it will not fire its caustics, and it will not fire its shutdown field. That is why, if you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, you don't need a shutdown field neutralizer on your ship. You can just stay cold instead, using your beam or a heatsink. Did I mention heatsinks are important? Let me say that again. Heatsinks are really, really important. Pay attention to the orbit pattern in this final attack run. 
I am moving downwards and laterally away from the goid. I am making it orbit me as it gives chase. Cold orbiting is not you orbiting the goid. It is making the goid orbit you. After the final heart is destroyed, the interceptor's halt no longer regenerates. Once the final heart of a cyclops breaks off, if you keep firing, you should be able to finish it off before its new shields comes up. But don't worry if you're not able to. In that case, just repeat the prior steps as if you were destroying an additional heart. And that's all there is to it. We have 8 million more in the bank to show for our efforts. Now it's your turn. AX combat is tough. Everyone makes mistakes at the beginning. Some mistakes are more common than others. Fortunately, most beginner mistakes are easily fixed. Certain mistakes are more serious than others. Let me start with those that can get you into serious trouble. Maybe the most universally common mistake, also affecting experienced commanders, is simply forgetting to sync before firing Goss. Without heat sync coverage, your heat will spike, the interceptor locks onto you, and you end up taking significant damage. Among beginners, a very common mistake is firing all Goss together on a single trigger instead of staggering them using primary and secondary fire. Firing that many weapons all together drains your weapons capacitor, making you heat spike, which results in the Goid locking onto you and inflicting direct damage on you. Another common mistake is firing your beam laser at the same time as your Goss. Let your heat sinks do their job. The beam will not keep you cold during exerts. In fact, it will do the opposite, as it competes with the Goss for limited distributor energy. Yet another mistake is firing too slowly. Thargoids constantly regenerate. Every shot you don't take is an extra shot that you'll need to land. Keep that fire rate up. When learning to cold orbit, it is sometimes a natural instinct to boost when under pressure. We call this panic boosting. Most of the time, boosting during an orbit does more harm than good, as it ruins your ability to control range and let your Goss deal damage. Try not to boost unless you have decided to abort the attack run entirely. During the shield phase, it is common to switch pip to 240 to more easily get away from the interceptor. You need to set them back to 024 before firing Goss. If you forget, your distro will drain and your heat will spike, resulting in the usual consequences. The following mistakes don't necessarily risk you failing the battle, but can still get in your way. It's common at first to fire your flak at the wrong time, for example, when the swarm is about to change direction. It is also common to release your shots too early or too late. The more time and ammo you waste dealing with the swarm, the less margin you'll retain to deal with the interceptor itself. Learning to time your shots properly will give you more of a buffer and will speed up your fight significantly. It's also common to instinctively try to turn and run when being grabbed by lightning. Unfortunately, lightning reduces your engine's thrust by a major amount. You won't be going anywhere while being zapped. It's best to try and turn towards the interceptor and use the time to make good hits. It's very possible to destroy a heart or even two while being captured by lightning. Forgetting to repair modules is a frequent mistake. In particular, module reinforcement packages are what keep your ship's other modules, among them your canopy, in one piece. Forgetting to repair MRPs results in all of your other modules quickly beginning to malfunction and fail while also significantly increasing the likelihood of encountering the infamous Canopy Breached experience. Make sure to check them and patch them up as needed with your AFMU in between each attack round. Lastly, forgetting to rearm is a mistake we all make. Running out of heat sinks or goss in the middle of an attack round can be especially frustrating and can ruin the entire run. Be sure to synth between attack runs if you're low on ammo. Heat sink synthesis in particular is dirt cheap. Don't be stingy, it's better to be safe than sorry in these fights. There are multiple additional resources to help you answer the many questions you likely have at this stage. The AXI Discord has many experienced commanders who will be happy to help you. You can submit videos of your fights there. Mentors will gladly review them and suggest improvements to consider for your next engagement. The AXI website contains news and information about our ranks and events. It is also the place where our leaderboards reside, showcasing some of the best and most inspiring kills commanders have achieved to date. Our wiki contains the sum of our collective wisdom on how to best fight Thargoids from the Interceptor's hull regeneration rate, to detailed information on the swarm's movement and patterns, and information on other AX weapons that goes into far more depth than it was possible to do in this video. 
check out the YouTube cards in this video for links to dedicated videos and example fights going into greater depth on each of the topics we introduced today. Finally, check the description of this video which contains references to all of the above in addition to links to our previously mentioned Meta Alliance Chieftain build which is ideal for starting out against Interceptors. We also link a less grind heavy, less engineered sister build. This is Commander M. Graham, Overseer and Leader of the Anti-Xeno Initiative. I hope you found this academy guide helpful in learning how to defend yourself and succeed in combat against Thargoids. Remember, the most important thing is to always stay alert and be prepared. Keep practicing the techniques and strategies we covered in this tutorial, and don't forget it's okay to disengage and try again. Practice leads to perfection. The Anti-Xeno Initiative is always here to support you on your journey into AX combat. Thank you for joining us on this fight to protect humanity. Fly safe, Commander.